The first three week race of the season, and many would say the best, is the Giro d'Italia. And it starts this Saturday, the 6th of May, and we cannot wait. Coming up, everything you need to know about the route, the riders, and the brutality of that final it week. It is brutal, isn't it? It's going to be beautiful to watch, but epic for all of the riders taking part. And the good news is that all GCN Plus subscribers will be able to watch every single kilometre of every single stage, both live and on demand on GCN Plus. Happy days. On top of the live coverage, we'll also have a pre and post race breakaway shows with Robin McEwen, Adam Blythe and Dan yep. joining all the Shenery in the studio with Rob Hatch and Sean Kelly on commentary. So if you're not already subscribed to GCN Plus, now would be a decent time to do so, wouldn't it? We'll let you know about some other Jira related content we've got for you later on in this preview show. But first up, should we talk about the route? Let's do it. Let's do the numbers to start with. 3,489 kilometers with over 51,000 meters of climbing over those 21 stages. Wow. Well, those stages are divided up into three individual time trials, eight flatter stages that may or may not be a final sprint, five hilly stages and five in the high mountains. Yes. Right, let's take a closer look at each one of those stages. And the three weeks kicks off in the province of Chieti with the first of those three individual time trials. Starting in Fossa Cesia, they will head north up the Adriatic coast and then finish in Ortona 19 kilometers later. Absolutely. Well, the first 17 kilometers are pan flat and not technical, but then they hit a climb to the finish that comes in two parts. The first section is 1.2 kilometers at just over 5% average gradient, with a few hairpin bends to negotiate as well. Then comes a short descent and a final false flat drag up to the line for the final kilometer. Yeah, and this, of course, Joe, is where Remco Avenapool takes an early advantage in the general classification. You think so? Even opinion. with Ghana, even with Roglic? Well, I'm comparing to GC riders, but yes, I think yeah. that this opening day's time trial is a parkour that's almost literally designed mm. for Remco Avenapool. I think the organisers really wanted him to race <laughs> here. So for me, Avenapool wins the stage, Ghana second, and Roglic third. That's my call. Well, feel free to comment in a few days' time if Dan has that completely wrong. <laughs> they remain in the Abruzzo region on stage two, which looks to be the first opportunity for the sprinters. There are a couple of fourth cat climbs in the middle of the stage, though, where the breakaway will fight it out for the first KOM jersey of the race and then a long flat run into San Salvo for the finish. Yes, with much of the stage hugging the coastline. There is a slim chance of crosswinds mm. there, isn't there? But it's a very slim chance because they rarely seem to be a thing at the Giro no. d'Italia or Italy in general, but you never know your luck. They are back along the same coastline at the start of stage three, but this one is unlikely to be for the pure sprinters no. with a little over 40 kilometers to go. They start climbing from the lakes of Monticcio, 6.3 kilometers at 6.4%, followed quickly by another shorter climb before a fast downhill run into the finish line in Melfi. Could be one for the break, but I reckon this has Mads Pedersen's name all over it. You're probably right. Or well, maybe Michael Matthews mm. from Jaco Alula, we shall see. Uh, stage four is the first of the really tough finishes, though. It starts in Venosa and finishes at Lago Laceno, which has been used in the race three times before now, the last of those being in 2012. The climb to the finish is only a second category, but then it is 9Ks long. And there's a section near the top of two and a half kilometers in distance where there are constant double digit gradients. Absolutely. But what could make the day particularly tough is that there are two climbs that precede that one to the finish. It's not a brutal day, but with 3,500 metres of climbing, it's tough enough. It is, yeah. I think this will be the first opportunity for the break to take the spoils, and there might well be someone in it who takes the leader's pink jersey too. Yeah, good call. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, stage five looks like it could be for the sprinters, although again, they're going to have to work quite hard for it. Uh, it starts in Atripalda in Campania. The first half of that day is on what I would say is lumpy terrain, whilst the second half is predominantly downhill looking at the profile and leads them eventually to the finish line, which is in Salerno. Which was last used as a finish in 1995 when Rolf Sorensen won, actually. Mm. 24 hours later, they'll be in Napoli for a circuit race. Although, unlike last year's stage in Napoli, there is just one big circuit starting and finishing in the city, rather than the multiple laps. There are two climbs on routes, but the last of those comes a long way from the finish line. Yeah, that one's the shortest road stage, mm. actually, of the Giro this year, just 156 kilometers or just under 100 miles. And on paper, again, it looks like it should be for the sprinters, but this is Napoli. <laughs> and the roads around there, 
Well, anything can happen, I think, on that day. Absolutely, anything can happen. Well, on Friday 12th of May, the race returns to the Abruzzo region for the first big mountaintop finish of the race. Mm. The Gran Sasso d'Italia, which last featured in 2018, is where Simon Yates outsprinted Thibaut Pinot to victory that day. Feels like a long time ago, mm, doesn't it? Does. Only four years. <laughs> uh, there's almost 4,000 metres of climbing over that 218 kilometre stage, so it's a really big test for the first week of a Grand Tour. In fact, it's the longest mountain stage of the route this year. Uh, that climb to the finish is 26 kilometers long, although it is only really the final 5Ks that are particularly hard. They average just over 8%. Yeah, well, another long stage greets them on day eight, 207 kilometers from Terni to Fossombroni in the Marque region. I really like the look of this profile, actually. Yeah, me too. With two laps of a circuit to, to the finish that takes in the short but steep Cappuccini climb, 2.1 kilometers at almost 10%. Yeah, short but steep. Yeah. Uh, that climb was used at Tirreno Adriatico in 2019, and that was a belter was. of a stage. I watched it back the other day. Uh, the difference with this stage at the Giro, though, is that between the two ascents of the Cappuccini climb, there's a longer one up to Monte della Cesane. And that one's known locally as Il Piccolo Mortirolo because of its steep gradients, which go up to 20%. Oh. Well, three steep climbs back to back in the finale of stage eight. That is definitely one yeah, to watch, definitely. isn't it? To conclude the first block of stages before the first of two rest days, we have the second of the individual time trials. It's in Chesna in the Romagna region, and although fairly flat, it is quite long at 35 kilometers. Well, you're young, Joe. It's <laughs> long by modern standards, I will grant I'll you that. I'll call it long. Uh, but you'd have thought Ganna versus Roglic versus Avon are called part two there, assuming, and of course hoping, that they are all still in the race. Absolutely. Uh, after the rest day, the race resumes on Tuesday the 16th of May with stage 10, which looks well suited to breakaway success. The start that day is in Scandiano in Emilia-Romagna and then the finish in Viareggio, which is on the coastline of Tuscany. Beautiful. Could be a break, although also could be one that Trek Segafredo control for Mads Pedersen. They've got again. a lot of work to do, haven't they, for they Mads do. Pedersen? They do. Race. As it looks like exactly the type of stage that he could get through and the other sprinters, of course, couldn't. Yeah. Well, stage 11 is not too dissimilar actually. It starts a little further up the coastline in Camiore, heading to Tortona. Yeah, and at 219 k's, that is the longest stage of this year's race. Yeah. The three ascents aren't particularly difficult, and with the last one cresting with over 40 k's to go, you'd have thought most of the sprinters should survive the day in the front group, but we I think shall they should. see. I think they should. Well, there are more medium mountains on the cars for stage 12 between Bra and Rivoli, including the Colle Brida, 10 kilometers at 7%. That'll be too much for the sprinters, you'd imagine, so the breakaway specialists will be licking their they lips. They will. Uh, we hit the Alps on stage 13 okay. and the highest point of this year's route, which means that the Chima copy of the 2023 Giro d'Italia is the Col de Grand Saint Bernard on the border between Italy and Switzerland. It's 2,469 metres above sea level. Crikey. <laughs> it's a climb that was last used during a Grand Tour at the Tour de France in 2009. And it's a bit of a beast by all accounts. It is. 34 kilometres <laughs> long at just over 5% average gradients. A 35 kilometer descent comes after, but then it's the Quad de Coeur, 15 kilometers at 8.8%. Mm. Well, it's the first one I'm still thinking about. Yeah. A 34K <laughs> climb, that's crazy. Something else. Uh, there's another long descent after the Quad de Coeur, and then some welcome flat road leads into the summit finish at Crans Montagne. Now on the profile, that final climb looks quite small, doesn't it? But in reality, <laughs> yeah. it's because it starts and peaks at a much lower altitude because it's still 16 kilometers long with a 7.2% average gradient. Yeah, well, with over 5,000 meters of climbing over 207 kilometers, this could be the queen stage yep. of the race. Stage 14 is a sprinter's nightmare though. Well, the second half is a dream, mm. being almost completely flat, but soon after the start in CS Switzerland, they climb up the Simplon Pass to over 2,000 metres above sea level. No doubt a strong break will go there, and then it will be a matter of whether or not the sprinters' teams bother chasing, I guess. Yeah, how much teams and riders they've yeah. got left to do chasing as well, I suppose. Uh, the second week of racing then concludes with a tough-looking stage to Bergamo. There aren't any high mountains that day, but plenty mm. of back-to-back -back climbs. Four of them are categorised, and with 3,600 metres of ascent over 191 kilometres. I wonder whether this one might be quite similar to the Torino stage of last year's race, that one where Bora Hansgrohe ripped the race to pieces. I hope so. It was a great stage, wasn't that it? Was, yeah. Well, 
Stage 16 in Trentino comes after the second rest day. There is some flats at the start of the day to get the legs warmed up, I guess, with views across Lake Garda. Very nice too. But then it's straight into the first of five categorized climbs. There is another gruelling day in the saddle in store here, Dan. Yeah, there is, yeah. yeah. Uh, the climb to the finish, actually, that day is the Monte Bondone. 21.4 k's, 6.7% average gradient, and the first time that climb's been used as a summit finish since 2006. I was actually looking back at the results from that day, and there were some huge mm. time gaps, even though they didn't have anywhere near as much climbing before they got to the summit finish that day. It's going to be another brute for sure. Mm. And stage 17 will be the last chance for the sprinters before the final day of the race. 192 kilometers in length, but most of the day is either flat or downhill en route to Cowley on the coast in Venice. And then it's onto a trio of stages in the high mountains. Yeah. Stage 18 has four big classified climbs, culminating with the Val di Zoldo at the end of 161 kilometers. Yep, that one's not been used since 2005 mm. at the Giro. Paola Salvadelli took <laughs> the spoils that day. Ahead of that climb, though, is the Koi, 6K at just under 10%, with a maximum of 19. Again, that one sounds like another brutal climb that I'd never even heard of. It does, but stage 19, I think, lays claim to the queen stage of the race, for me at least. Well, you keep changing your mind. <laughs> I can well, see what you mean, though. Well, there's four huge climbs throughout the day. The Paso Campolongo, the Paso Valparolo, Paso Giao, and then the highest summit finish of the entire race at the Trecime de Lavaredo. Which is a whopping 2,304 metres above mm. sea level. The total that day of climbing is 5,400 metres over 182 kilometres. So yeah, I can see why you might think that that is the queen stage of the race, but there are a few candidates this year. Absolutely. Well, it also depends on if we get weather conditions like we did in 2013, where Vincenzo Nibali won the stage and officially declared himself the winner of the Giro. It really was some of the most epic weather conditions in recent yes, times, wasn't it? Dan? I remember them quite well because I was actually on the finish line that day, but thankfully, inside a nice warm commentary box. But I remember looking out at all the sh shivering soigneurs. It was ridiculously cold. Anyway, stage 20, the penultimate of the race and the third and by far the hardest mm. of the three individual time trials. It finishes up Monte Lassare in Tarvisio Udine, never before been used at the Giro d'Italia, but at 7.8 kilometers in distance and 11.8% average gradient. Unbelievable. I don't know how to describe it. It's going to be, it's going to be a spectacle for, for the spectators and the viewers, <laughs> isn't it? We're certainly going to enjoy it, yeah. but the first five kilometres of the climb down, they're over 15% on average <laughs> gradient, with sections over 22%. You know what, this morning I was listening to the What's Occurring podcast with Geraint Thomas. He is, of course, one of the favourites, as we'll get onto yeah. later, but all he seems to be thinking about for the last few weeks is that final time trial to Monte Lusano. There's plenty of time to be won and lost, isn't yeah. there, with those gradients? Well, there are 10 kilometers of flat road before the start of that climb, so you'd imagine there'll be some fr frantic bike changes at the start of the yeah. climb, wouldn't you? And if the GC isn't wrapped up already by this stage of the race, it certainly will be It will be, yes. Uh, incidentally, Joe, the views from the top are incredible. Mm. I doubt the riders will spend much time appreciating them, at least on the way up the mm. climb, but maybe Ollie Bridgewood will, because he's actually hoping to ride up that final climb for us if the snow clears in time. He is, and that is a video of pure suffering that I absolutely cannot wait to watch. <laughs> After the stage, there is a long 600 kilometer journey south to Rome for the 21st and final stage of the race. And it's the only real reason the sprinters will be motivated to get through those high mountains across the final yeah, week. Yeah, have something like a yeah. carrot dangling <laughs> for them at the end of the race. Uh, depending on which part of the official website you look at, it's either 135 <laughs> or 136 kilometers. But either way, it's almost completely flat and it's going to be a ceremonious ride for whoever's in the pink jersey. But like Joe said, one final chance for the sprinters to shine. Certainly is. Right, just before we get on to the riders, we wanted to let you know a bit more about what else we've got for you in the month of May beyond the live and on-demand racing. Yep, uh, we already mentioned, but Ollie Bridgewood is heading out to Italy to look at all the latest tech from the Giro. Italia and ride that brutal mm. final climb of stage 20. Ride slash walk, I think you mean, Dan. Yes, and he's a very slow walker as well, so it could be a long day. <laughs> long video as well. Meanwhile, on the app, there'll be written previews of every single stage that are free to read, even if you're not a GCN Plus subscriber, plus stage profiles and maps, start lists and results, and much more as well. There is. Yeah, actually, we've got a special Jira collection of films on GCN Plus, and amongst them, we've got Nibali, the final year, 
Uh, so essentially, we followed him throughout 2022 in his final season as a pro. But that documentary actually chronicles his whole career and is already out to watch. Uh, but one we've got coming up for you is about Andy Hampson's legendary 1988 win at the race and that epic climb of the Garvia mm. in the sleet and snow. You'll all have seen the pictures. That one will be available to watch in a couple of weeks' time on May the 14th. Yeah, we also have a special collection of merchandise to celebrate the first Grand Tour of the season. You can find them all over on shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. And if you're a member of the GCN Club, you'll be receiving a special pair of pink socks this month. Yes, which I handily have right here to hand. Nice uh, so as a indeed. club member, you'll receive these Paso Jow socks very soon if you haven't done so already. Right, on to the key riders taking part. Yep. And we'll start with the favourites for the pink jersey in Rome, Primoz Roglic and Remco Evenepoel. Yeah, of the two, I was looking this morning, it's actually Evenepoel mm. who's the favourite with the bookmakers, albeit only just. This will only be his third participation at a Grand Tour, but given he won the Vuelta last year and his recent dominance at Liège, Baston Liège, you can sort of see why he'd be the favourite. But there's also, of course, a very good case to be made for Primoz Roglic. He's won three of the last four Grand Tours he's finished, but failed to finish three of the last four Grand Tours that he started. It's a bit of a riddle, isn't it? It is a bit of a riddle. But yeah, essentially, if he makes it through the three weeks unscathed, there's a very good chance he'll get to Rome in the pink jersey. Yeah. He's certainly got a strong team in the race, probably the strongest in my opinion. Yeah. Sepp Kuss has been called up to the squad that also includes Foss, Tratnik, Bauman and Hessink for the climbs, plus a Fini for everything else. It's a solid squad, it isn't is, it? So As it you'd is. expect, really, from Jumbo Visma in mm. the modern day. Sudal Quickstep, meanwhile, uh, do bring a number of the riders who shepherded Avonapool to victory at last year's Welter. Three, in fact, mm. Vaca, Van Wilder and Masnada. Of the riders, though, who weren't in Spain last September, Jan Hirt and Matteo Catano boost their climbing uh, even further, whilst Ballerini and Cherny look to be the engines for the flatter stages. It's a strong squad, isn't it? Yeah. Albeit with a little less experience in the Grand Tours. 41 Grand Tour starts for Sudar Quickstep's Giro squad versus 63 for Jumbo Visma. Yeah, it's marginal, isn't it? Mm. But I think most of those 63 are Robert Hessing. I think it's 61. <laughs> it's a good no. portion, isn't it? Uh, anyway, if Avonapool does win, Killian Kelly's stat for you here, He'll be the first reigning world champion to win a Grand Tour since Greg LeMond in 1990. But I think he's going to fade in the last week of this race, personally. That's a big call. It's a big call, but it's one I am willing to make. It's a very big call. I mean, he's make. been on such good form, hasn't he? You can see how much he's pushing himself in training in Spain. And I think it's the fact that he puts so much nervous energy into racing. I think he'll... I mean, the last week of the Vuelta was nowhere near as brutal as this year's Giro d'Italia. And he was also fading a little bit there. He's a year older, a year wiser, but we shall see. That's my call. Big call nonetheless. Anyway, moving on, the only former winner on the start line this year is Theo Gegenhart, who co-leads a strong Ineos Grenadiers team. Alongside him, Geraint Thomas, Pavel Sivkov and Simon Aronsman, all of whom I reckon could be GC leaders in their own right. Well, they could be in other teams mm. maybe, but yeah. it seems like Terry Gegenhart and Geraint Thomas will be the protected leaders yeah, of the team, doesn't so. it? Uh, Geraint Thomas, whilst he hasn't had great results so far this year, is someone that knows exactly how to stay calm and how to be good and peak at the right time, isn't he? He's been hit by bad luck in this race in the past, plus a lot of other races <laughs> in his career, to be fair. But if he gets through unscathed like Roglic, uh, he'll be pretty strong in the final re week, I reckon. Should be. Well, the bookies have him as third favourite, just slightly shorter odds than Theo Gegenhart. And the fifth favourite for the race is Joao Almeida of UAE, a man who spent over two weeks in the pink jersey back in 2020. And he's such a solid rider, isn't he, Dan? Both mentally and physically. He is, yes. I love the way he paced yeah. himself up the mountains. Uh, Almeida has finished three Grand Tours in his career, Never been outside the top six, Some record. but also has yet to finish on the podium of one. <laughs> Fourth at this race in 2020 overall was his best result at the Grand Tour so far, but he's only 24. You'd, you'd imagine that his best years are still ahead of him, wouldn't you'd you? You'd think so, you'd think so. He won't be the sole leader of the team though. This Giro will be the first time that Jay Vine has started a Grand Tour with GC ambitions. And I've got to say, nothing at all would surprise me. What, with his result? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't get any result at all. And I don't think I'd be surprised if he won the thing. Well, given how good he looked at the world of last year, I can see what you're saying, because before he crashed out, there was no doubt that he had the power to be up there with the big yeah. boys. Hard to tell where he's at, though, this year, really, isn't it? Because I don't think he's raced since the UAE Tour. No. We had knee problems back in February. But if there's one thing that we all know, it's that Jay Vine is bloody good at training. He is. Isn't it? He'll be on good form, I'm sure of that. 
They've got a really strong team too, of course. Ulysses has a wealth of experience, particularly at the Giro. Mm -hmm. McNulty, a wealth of strength, plus Covey and Formlow add to their depth in the mountains. They've got a very good squad, mm, haven't they? Uh, moving on to the team that won here last year, Bora Hansgrohe. No Jai Hindley, mm. he's not making a return this year. So instead, Alexander Vlasov is their team leader. A rider who's been 11th, 4th and 5th in the three Grand Tours he's finished so far. So like Almeida, yet to finish mm. on a Grand Tour podium. He's not quite been in the same form this year, though, as he was at the start of no. 2022. But that, of course, might be part of the plan. I'll also be interested to see what the plan is for Lena Kemner. Yeah. He's a rider that has very successfully, of course, focused on stage hunting in the past. But this year, he seems to be turning himself into a bit of a GC candidate, He does, yeah. He? I was looking back at his yeah. results this year. Fourth overall at Torreno, sixth at the Tour of the Alps, plus a stage win there. You'd have thought they'd at least play it by ear with him when it comes to the general classification. Maybe just sort of see where he's at after a week or 10 days and play it from there. Definitely one to watch in the first week. Mm -hmm. Well, next up, EF Education Easy Post, who are led by Hugh Carthy. He's not yet been quite able to back up that Vuelta podium from 2020, but his form at the Tour of the Alps looked good. He'll also have the experience of Rigo Aran alongside him, whilst an informed Ben Healy makes his Grand Tour debut. We think. We're still going on a provisional start list and notoriously EF don't release their official roster until about an hour before the race, <laughs> do they? Uh, in a similar situation to EF are Bahrain victorious. We've got Jack Haig, who was also third at the World a year after Carthy. Now again, he looked really good at the Tour of the Alps and Bahrain have got a really strong squad here. Santiago Butrago, he's only getting better, isn't yeah. he? With age, what is he, 21, 22 yeah, podium now? At Liège. Uh, Caruso, a former podium finisher here. He looked great at the Tour de Romandie last week. And they've got Gino Maida, who's always a threat yeah. as well. They've certainly got cars to play, yeah. haven't they? That's for sure. Well, what about Thibaut Pino, Dan? Who knows? I'm Who knows? I'm surprised, actually. He was 250 to 1 for the race. And of course, the TTs won't be particularly to his liking, at least the first two of them. But he's got a proven track record at the Giro with a fourth place in 2017, albeit six years ago. Yeah. And he was good in 2018 as well. Yeah, he got ill in the final yeah. few stages, yeah. I think, maybe on the penultimate day. I mean, what I do know is that there aren't many people who wouldn't love to see Thibaut Absolutely. Pino on the podium in Rome. There's not many no. who would feel like that, is there? Very few. Uh, a couple of other outsiders for a good GC. Domenico Pozzavivo, who's now with Israel Premier Tech. Eddie Dunbar, who looks to be going in the right direction mm -hmm. after an injury-riddled start to the season. He will lead Jaco Alula. Uh, Lorenzo Fortunato of Iola, who won in Asturias last week. Uh, Ryan Tarame of Antimarche. And Ina Rubio, maybe, of Mobistar as well. Yeah, I'm interested to see if he goes. Just before we move on to the sprinters, though, we thought we'd give a mention to the six riders who can complete their collection of Grand Tour stages at this year's Giro. I.e., they've already won a stage of the Tour and the Welter and can complete the set at the Giro. Mads Pedersen, mm -hmm. Bauke Mollema, Simon Clark, Sepp Kuss, Magnus Kortz and Warren Bargill. If the provisional start list mm. is to be believed. You'd have thought of those six, Pedersen's got the best chance of completing Absolutely. the collection. Uh, and that's a good, good segue into the sprinters actually, because he's one of them. And there aren't that many sprinters at this year's race, Not are there? Not many at all. Jakobsen, Malia, Grunewagen, Philipsen, Bennett, Coy, De Lee, Ewan, None of them are racing the Giro, Dan. No. That's There's a good, good explanation, explanation, though, isn't there? For Absolutely. Yeah, no losses lots of... out the race at all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's hard for them to be here <laughs> when their team hasn't been selected or decided not to participate. Yeah. No longer World Tour, of course. Uh, besides Pedersen, then, the sprinters that are at the Giro this year, Mark Cavendish, mm -hmm. Fernando Gaviria, both winners of multiple sprint stages in the past, plus Caden Groves, Pascal Ackerman, Giacomo Nizzolo, Alberto Dainese took that surprise mm -hmm. win last year. Uh, Magnus Court of EF, Michael Matthews, and probably Simone Consoni yeah. of Cofidis as well. Well, Cavendish is yet to win a race with his new team, Astana, but a third place at Scale de Priest was promising. Yep. If he takes a win here, it'll be his 17th at the Giro and his 54th Grand Tour 50 stage win. No, I guess that, yeah, 34 at the Tour. <laughs> Crikey, it still sounds Some like Some number, isn't it? 54 Grand Tour <laughs> stage wins. But I think that Gaviria is the man to beat yeah. the Giro. Yeah, I saw you mention that on the Racing News Show this week, actually. <laughs> Probably another cold take. We'll see. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Either way, it does feel like it's a real opportunity for the sprinters that are here, doesn't it? None of them have a really good lead-out train, so it could be some really chaotic finishes. I think you're right. It's a great opportunity yeah. for all of the sprinters who are here without the current big names Absolutely. of sprinting on the start line. Uh, we should probably finish uh, with the riders by giving a nod to Filippo Ganna. He's yet to lose a time trial at the Giro d'Italia, 
But with Avon Paul and Roglic here, it's going to be pretty tough, isn't it, for him to keep that record? It certainly is. Hot take. Yep. He'll only win one of the three time trials. Yeah, I think for it to be a hot take, I would say that you need to specify which one of the three. I think he'll win the second, the longer one. I think he'll win the third. You think? No. <laughs> <laughs> he finishes up take. a brutal climb. <laughs> anyway, uh, it'll be interesting to see who comes out on top in the first two flatter time trials if uh, Ghana does indeed win the final one. Stefan Kung, actually, is also mm -hmm. riding, talking to time trials, as is the world champion Tobias Foss. He dearly loved to mm. finally get a win in that rainbow yeah. jersey. He was very close in Romandy. And Matteo Sobrero will be hoping to repeat his time trial victory that he got at the end of last year's race. Okay then, on to our predictions. Who are you going for, Dan? I'm going to let you go first, partly because I forgot to think about this before we started <laughs> recording. Big pressure. I think... Should we go for the podium? First, let's, second, third? Let's go for the podium. Okay. I think we'll see Primoz Roglic in pink. Right. I think he's got the, he's got the, the experience. I think Remco Evenepoel will start flying out the blocks in the first week or so. I yep, think he'll lead early, early doors. But I think he'll fade and finish third in the end. And I think we'll have the Wiley Garrett Thomas in second place. He's going to pace his effort perfectly. But he'll be picked by Roglic, I think. Wow. That's not far off what I was going no? to say. I, yeah. I'm going to also say Roglic is yeah? going to take the win. Like we said at the start of the show, if he stays on his bike, he is an incredibly yeah. difficult rider to beat because he just doesn't have a weakness. He's always calm. He's always calculating. And he's got that sprint for the bonus yeah, second as well. That's exactly what we saw at Catalonia. Second place... I can't really go with a second the same as you as well. So I'm going to go with Jay Vine. Are you really? Just completely out there. <laughs> I mean, we've got no idea on his form, but again, that glimpse that we had at the World to last year, like if he has got his preparation mm. right, those are some incredible numbers that he was producing For there. Sure. Uh, and then I'll go third, Geraint Thomas. No Avonapool on the podium. No Remco Avonapool on the podium. I mean, I've kind of just said that to get people talking, <laughs> but it, it's... <laughs> I do think he's going to crack. Yeah. I just think he's been on such good form for so long. I think he's going to go, like you said, blitz it in the first yeah. week. But the brutality, the steepness of the gradients in that final week, I don't think it's something that he's actually done before. It's, not, not, it's way harder than the world yeah. it was last year. I think, I think the race is certainly set to be decided in that final week, isn't mm. it? Who's best there, I think? We'll end in the Malay racer. Yes, uh, we should say that we are impartial here. Oh, I would love to see Avon Paul win. I think yeah. it'd be great for the sport. I think it'd be great for Belgian cycling for him to continue his run of Grand Tour success. Mm -hmm. But that's just my prediction, which are partly made to get you all talking <laughs> and commenting. Uh, right, let us know in the comment section just down below your podium prediction for the race at the end of the three weeks in Rome. Uh, don't forget our live coverage, on demand, and all those different highlight packages to suit your time availability and needs. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you again very soon indeed.